Quran and went through the Hadiths and uh, and uh, all of the uh, Shahi, the various laws and interpretation. They said, now nah, get rid of him. So they took the eldest boy of uh, the murdered man's family and handed him a Kalashnikov and he shot the other guy right on the spot. Right. Done. Finished. Yeah. Finished in the right way, they say. Well, anyway, that's what they would prove. They would pre prefer that sort of governance as opposed to some... Somebody, uh, you know, who's been appointed from Kabul who comes out and tells him what the hell to do, and he doesn't even speak the language. Okay, education system. You know, NGOs, you have uh, everyone from Loma Linda over here uh, by Chino or wherever it is, Riverside, to UNESCO to this, that, and the other. Yeah, everybody's got an elementary school and a school here to this, that, and the other thing. Medicine is taught in hospitals or hospitals in the major cities. University exists, and in several towns, uh, but they're not really universities after uh, our feeling of university. I don't think anybody who's ever been accredited there has ever gotten any credit here for transfer. They, well, in the first place, well, <laughs> we'll go on. there are madrasas. There are religious schools. I would say probably a very, very small portion of the uh, population actually knows how to read Arabic script. And it, uh, those who do have either learned it formally in, uh, in the university or a regular school because the Arabic script is the script that their language is written in. But the madrasas uh, teach Arabic and the Arabic script, and uh, there you go. <laughs> That's the way it's perpetuated. Now, basically, politics have stifled. Now, rural, rural schools are destroyed. In other words, the, the dirt farmers, these guys are subsistence dirt farmers. They, uh, uh, they have very little use for, uh, uh, what will I say, modern things, TV sets, Chevrolets. Uh, you know, they like Toyota pickup trucks because you can put a machine gun mount on the back of it and drive around and intimidate people. But uh, beyond that, they, uh, you know, of what, what value are schools? And basically... And I think you'll find most Afghans uh, who are there will agree with this. The system of education will only evolve when foreign uh, occupation has been eliminated so that we are not projecting ourselves on them and the people find a need for it. Until they have a need for education, what good is education? It's foolish for us to throw away money on something they don't want. The resources, what do they have? They have an awful lot of good things. I can recall walking over fields of coal that the locals said were just useless because nothing would grow on them. And you, you know, you're walking maybe two or three miles over just open coal. Uh, they have talc, they have iron ore. The iron ore is inaccessible. There have been several people trying to figure out how to get iron ore out of there. One of the ways that they've been doing it is, or at least uh, attempted to do them, was to uh, slurry it, crush it, slurry it, and pump it and then uh, extract the water from it on the far end. So uh, because it's absolutely inaccessible, it would be ridiculous to try and put roads into some of these areas where mines do exist. They have rubies, they have lapis lazuli, they have emerald, and these things come to market, and that's where the Shura and the Zahar, or that was the, the folks that had just about lost the Civil War were getting their funding by selling uh, various gemstones. Natural gas. Natural gas is a tremendous natural gas field up in Shirvargan in northern Afghanistan. The Russians paid for their occupation by selling that gas to, the, to Western Europe. <laughs> in other words, they went in, exploited the field. You'll hear the name uh, uh, Abdur Rashid uh, Dostam. And Mr. Dostam uh, was a KGB border general, and he also was the, uh, the head of the gas fields in Shirvargan. So that was his role, was to uh, make sure the Russians didn't miss a, a, a single uh, million cubic feet that was coming out of there. Today, the Chinese are mining and exploiting copper. The Chinese went in there and immediately, we go in there and we, uh, we're busy uh, funding aircraft and all sorts of weird stuff. The Chinese go in and cut a deal. <laughs> They're making money off all this. <laughs> Okay, the terrain, the lack of infrastructure, general and so forth, you know, economic development of mines, refineries, roads, and support industries, they all fail. 
the Chinese go in there and they say, oh, we want copper. We'll put it in and we'll see you later. The next thing you know, you got Chinese shipping out copper. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, if corruption was a resource, but one or two countries would be better endowed. Development. Okay. What happens when you're in Kabul? Somebody asked uh, if you wanted a place with a flush toilet, what would you have to do? <laughs> You'd have to suffer. That's what you'd have to do. Understand the stores that we know and are non-existent. There's no Costco. There's no Safeway. There's no Home Depot. You know, if you want it, it either is smuggled in, found in the bazaar, made for you, or you do it yourself. That's it. If you wanted a flush toilet, you'd have to show somebody how to make one, and he'd have to build a kiln big enough to be able to to cook it. And uh, there you go. Otherwise, you wouldn't have one. There's no potable water. Okay, flush toilet a few. Open sewers prevail. In other words, uh, you go out on the street. It's very simple. No trash pickup. There's no reliable electricity. There's no freeways. There's very few macadamized or uh, or paved streets, roads, whatever. Most areas there are footpaths, animal tracks, rather than vehicular roads. As a matter of fact, uh, the guys who are CIA uh, sent over there discovered that their horses uh, uh, being run at night were running on paths no more than a couple of inches wide. And these guys, when they found out where they'd been the day, uh, the next day, they were amazed. Like, how in the hell did we get over that? And the ass were getting a bang out of this. They'd slap the horses on the rump just to get them to, to trot on these narrow paths. Okay, gas station. There aren't any gas stations. I think there's two gas stations in Kabul. The rest are 55 gallon drums with a hand pump. Everybody's got armed guards, bodyguards. Everybody has two cell phones. This is free enterprise that is greatest. You know, half of Kabul's under one cell phone company, the other half's under another one. So you have to have two cell phones. You want to phone Herb and he's not in this section, you have to use the other cell phone. <laughs> I, again, my the lower sections, so they get the water. The water comes down. Here's the way water is distributed. We got acre feet here in California. Acre feet is the the right of a, of a person who has agriculture, so many acre inches or whatever. The Hyperion laws or the water laws in the state of California came directly from the Arabs. We are an arid country. Their water rights are the same way. I have, if I have a spring on my property, I will have a holding tank. That's my water. But the spring continues to run, so I have to let that water go on downhill. I can't uh, plug up the spring or stop it. The next guy down will also have a tank down the hill. The next guy down the hill, next guy down the hill, and so on, all the way down until eventually you have some water that's trickling out into the plain. The way the Afghans had handled that before were to make kadis. And kadis are underground aqueducts, and they had underground aqueducts that ran all over the country, particularly into the desert areas and into the, Hel the Helmand Valley, where now they're uh, exploiting opium poppy. But in any event, the Russians came in, blew up the Kadis system so that it wasn't functional, primarily because they felt that the Az were using these as bomb shelters or as means by which to hide from uh, the explosives and gunfire and so forth. So essentially, uh, there went the water distribution system. Today, you find people in Kabul have to buy their way into putting in a tube well and believe me, with open sewers, tube wells are pretty damn useless anyway. The only thing that comes out of it is kind of turgid water that you want to boil or disinfect or do something to before you even get near you. I mean, it's... <laughs> so there you go. Disease development? Pardon me? Do they have a lot of disease? Well, they'll deny it, but uh, I have a feeling there's a, a, a kind of endemic uh, uh, cholera, for example. Uh, everybody gets dysentery. Uh, I, it's not not uh, the land of milk and honey you might perceive. You don't drink water, for example. You don't get near water as far as that's concerned. If you do, you want to wash it off with sand or something. In the high mountains, you would look for springs. 
Koi Sophia was a very, very good place to be. There was water. There were natural springs all over the place. And so, you know, you had the snow melt and springs, and uh, it was a good place to be. The further you get away from the mountain areas, the worse uh, living becomes. All right, moving right along here. Future. 